This is a production of Cornell University. So uh, I love origin stories, you know, like superheroes, all that. So like I got my origin in my love of diversity and plants from looking at teeth and you look at shapes and sizes and colors of teeth and really like all of that love, I think really like most of us might be, have fallen in love with biology because of diversity, whether that's on like the molecular level, just trying to figure out why things work a certain way. But like agricultural diversity is so exciting to work in because there's this immediate connection with the public because we've all eaten corn, we've all had carrots. And then when you show people like what's behind the scenes in a grocery store, like you very, even as great of a store as Wegmans, like there's very little representation of the full diversity in agriculture. And it's such a, a remarkable thing. So these are, you know, some of the seed crops that are just so fantastic and colorful to look at. And these are our crops. And so, you know, I'm going to talk to you today about the, the national collection of apples, tart cherries and grapes and really it's important to note, like, as you get to know plant germplasm collections, plant genetic resource collections, like, this is not like an all-star show. Like, this is not the greatest hits of Apple. This is really like trying to maximize or really preserve the full genetic diversity. That means like the extreme great apples are mixed in with the terrible ones, things that you'll never want to really taste or try ever again. So, so we range in, you know, from a sweet, crunchy apple like honey crisp down to like a styrofoam juiceless apple and really all of that has tremendous value in, ter in terms of you know the future right so like my talk today is, is on preserving the future and really like in collections we a lot of people come really excited and interested in seeing old heirloom apples there's a, a huge movement in that or seeing you know heirloom grapes from the Geneva collection really it's it's about preserving the past present and all of this effort goes into like creating the future. It's like what our crops look like today will depend on the genetic resources that we are preserving. So as part of the National Plant Germplasm System, we have a mission to acquire, preserve, characterize, and distribute genetic material of plants. And really, so uh, nationwide, we have about, you know, 596,000 accessions represented of all of our major crops and most importantly, like they're wild relatives. So not just crops, but also they're, they're wild relatives that can be useful for, for breeding. And I love this quote by Francois Jacob. Diversity is a way of coping with the possible. It acts as a kind of insurance for the future. So as we think about sustainability in agriculture, like genetic diversity plays a, a large role in that. So here we are in, in Geneva. And um, so we have a USDA site there partnered with Cornell Agritech. And it's such a beautiful partnership. Not only do we get a large portion of our starting material for grapes from the grape breeding program and apple from Cornell's apple breeding program, but we have a partnership with the entomologists and pathologists there. And it's such a, a strong, you know, team there that we have to, to preserve our resources, to make them, you know, available worldwide. So other notable sites for uh, our other uh, Partner crops are Davis, California, which is where we see the other part of the, the grape collection and also the rest of the prunus. And Fort Collins comes into play for us a lot. That's our cryopreservation backup site that I'll, I'll mention later. But there's about 20 sites in total, you know, really to, to maximize this, this effort to conserve diversity. So there's a lot of like analogies to gene banks, and especially we hear so many good ones. This is one of my favorite ones, but we'll hear Oh, you're like a Noah's Ark. You're like Noah's Ark. You're a library of apples. This is one of my favorites. Does anyone recognize this building? Yeah, world famous, one of the best museums in the world. So what does the Louvre and our collection have in common? And you can... I said the Mall Lisa. The Mall L, yeah. <laughs> so this is... You're going to get used to my cheesy jokes when I do tours. It's full of cheesy jokes, but like... They're both better to visit. So if you, I can sit here and talk about our collections or you can come visit the collection and taste fruit. You can walk through and like really see how impressive. So I, I do so many tours each year and this is actually kind of a painful experience because I can't just like show you the plants. I can't reach over and show you grape leaves and show you like how they're different from one another. And so really like come and see 
the diversity and like, it really is uh, impactful. So it's, uh, this is our public tour, September 19th from nine to 11. So we get a lot of requests, but we also do many tours for, for groups, for research teams. Like if you're interested and like wanna come you know, tour with your classes, yeah, we would love to, to host you. Anyone recognize this? Yeah, this has a beautiful nickname, the Doomsday Vault, right? Like this is like end of the world conservation, which is a, an important part. Like we want to store up genetic res resources in the event of a natural disaster or chaos in the world. But like, this is our collection. So we are completely vulnerable. It's like, so we deal with pest disease, like all the challenges of, of an ag agricultural system, but like we're doing it out in the open. And this, you know, this uh, vulnerability also promotes its accessibility. So there are ways that we can keep, you know, apples and grapes stored away, tucked nicely and safely in a gene bank in a cryopreservation system. But then when you want to come and sample the fruit or evaluate fruit or get pollen for a cross, like it's not available. And so this is like really contrasting other gene banks. So we have seed preservation, which all of our um, major vegetable crops, you know, wheat, uh, corn, tomato, like all of those are preserved by a seed, whereas for apples, grapes, tart cherries, all of our major horticultural crops, a large majority of them are conserved clonally, so which means we have to either keep a tree in the field or budwood in cryopreservation. This is an older picture, but like, yeah, we've expanded quite a bit. So back here is, this is the, the first part of our apple collection. Here's our grapes, and back here on the hill would be our tart cherry collection. But we have about 7,600 accessions. And this is one of the largest apple collections in the world and one of the most you know, significant collections for, for apple you know, genetic resources worldwide. Um, we also have one of the largest grape collections and a small prunus collection that I'll, I'll highlight each collection individually. But this really is, is amazing, this technology of grafting and budding. So we use, you know, there's lots of techniques to propagate plants. So we use you know, clonal propagation using budding. In our, so, and thanks to Todd Holleran, who's our hand model here. But really, so you can start by, you know, excising a bud, which will go on to produce a branch, which can fruit, which can really carry that genetic material. So these are all clonally propagated because through meiosis, through seed, you know, production, you've lost that cultivar identity through high heterozygosity. So we really, the only way to maintain trueness to type in these crops is through clonal propagation. So really excising a bud, placing it onto a rootstock for apple and cherry. Whoops, sorry. You know, using a, a rubber, uh, a budding rubber to, to, to hold that bud in place while it heals. You can pull it off. And so here's the, the, the rootstock portion. And now here's where the bud for that, whatever sign material you're interested in will take hold and then produce a new shoot. Oh, yeah. So here's budding, rubber, a budding rubber. So here's where the graft has taken hold. And then if you're lucky, you'll get a shoot. So then from there you can, you know, you've propagated a tree. So imagine so for each of our 5,000 apple trees, like we've done this that many times to conserve that, those genetic resources. Grapes are much easier. So grapes can self root. And uh, actually it, for industry purposes, they're, they are also are grafted, but for our purpose, we want to keep the you know, just a, a single system. So that way we can re-propagate from, uh, from root shoots as well. And so, you know, it's a tremendously useful and ancient system to propagate plants. And then here's the cryopreservation portion. So we work with Fort Collins and their researchers to, to really back up this material. And again, this isn't the idea for doomsday. We pull material out of cryopreservation quite frequently as things are lost to disease, again, we are fully vulnerable to everything, and some accessions are highly susceptible to, to major diseases. But for apple, this works beautifully. A lot of stuff can be you know, directly preserved in cryopreservation. Cherry is a little bit more challenging, and grape is exceptionally challenging. So a new method to preserve grapes involves uh, droplet vitrification. Just, uh, so now you've added a step of not only cryo, but now you have to go through tissue culture, which you, as you can imagine is, is challenging as well. Germplasm distribution. So this is really showing our, how we touch the world with our material. So a large part of what we do is make this 
material accessible to for breeding purposes for research. And so there, this is, you know, annually the National Plant Germplasm System distributes about a quarter of a million. Whoops, sorry, this is really jumpy. About a quarter of a million accessions accessions each year, and it's a it's pretty phenomenal phenomenal when you see the impact on the world that we have. From Geneva, we've, you know, in the last five years, we've touched 45 countries. And so now they have access to that germplasm for their own uh, programs or for their own industrial development. And that's including a seed and clonal. But it's really, you know, quite remarkable to think about like how we're not only preserving, but sending this material out into the world. So I'll just like to go by and highlight each of the, the collections on their own. So the tart cherry collection. So this is not just People think a tart cherry is just a, a sour sweet cherry. It's actually a different species. It's a hybrid between the sweet cherry Prunus avium and a wild uh, cherry Prunus fruticosa. Fruticosa is a tetraploid, so then the, the, the hybrid tart cherry Prunus cerasis is this tetraploid mess that is, is beautiful and diverse and but challenging to work with as a, as a tetraploid. But they are cold hardy, which is part of the reason that they are in Geneva. So other Prunus crops are very cold sensitive, whereas Prunus racist is not. A large portion of the collection comes from Michigan State University and uh, their, their cherry rootstock and breeding program there. But what I find fascinating about the tart cherry collection is this unique chemistry. So all cherries look red, but what makes a sweet cherry red versus a tart cherry is, is just a very different chemical composition. And so this is, you know, I forgot to highlight, this is Montmorency. So this is a 400 year old cherry. And I always highlight this one because most of the US industry is based on this one cherry type, which is you can imagine like very dangerous, right? <laughs> like very risky. So it's about a 70 to $90 million industry in the US. And so if anything happens to this cultivar, right? Like if the climate shifts and no longer like, can you maximize production or a new disease or anything that might threaten its stability, you've lost that production. And so when we look at Montmorency chemistry, Montmorency here, when we look at like the anthocyanin composition, it has about 100 micrograms per gram of tissue. And, but then you compare it to some of the other accessions, which has nearly you know, 100 times that, or 10 times that uh, anthocyanin concentration, which also maintains a lot of um, high fruit quality and, and production value. But a lot of the the interest in tart cherries for tart cherry juice for you know the, the nutritional value. So if you can increase the nutritional value by increasing anthocyanins, not only do you have a more stunning product to deliver, but now you know potentially higher in nutritional content. So this this plot represents the, the genetic diversity within our collection. The red is uh, Prunus avium, the sweet cherry. This is the wild Prunus fruticosa. And then here you have the tart cherries. And this molecular data is so valuable for us because we find anomalies or mistakes. So if you were to look really closely in this, you would find several tart cherries mixed in with the sweet cherries. And then when you test their chemical fingerprint, yeah, they match that of a sweet cherry. So there's something wrong in their classification that now we can address. Or you'll see several of, of the fruticosa actually fall in with the, the tart cherries. So again, so we can find mistakes, we can find relationships and really understand how to, how to better use our, our diversity. So this is also a beautiful project for students to work on because they can come in in the summer, see the full cycle from bloom to harvest, and they can collect data. So over the last, uh, we have five seasons of data now on the entire cherry collection, really. And so the, the lines that you see here in red represent Montmorency. So if that's hard to see, we have you know, total soluble solids. Montmorency score is quite low in compared with some of the other very extreme sweet tart cherries. You know, the same for, for malic acid, it scores you know, fairly low on the distribution for, for acidity. There's much more acidic tart cherries. Um, weight it actually does pretty well. This is one of the main reasons why it can, or the production stuck on Montmorency. It, it's a great producer. Like, very consistent, bearing, very uh, very good weight that is really hard to beat with some of the other uh, tart cherry cultivars. But this is the, the anthocyanin content. So this is that unique um, anthocyanin in tart cherries. And you see like Montmorency is very low on the distribution. We have some extreme high anthocyanin contents, which is really fascinating from a, a genetic perspective. And 
we do hope to follow up on these studies and understand more the, you know, the, the accumulation, which we show, I'm showing here, like several of these interesting varieties, like how they accumulate anthocyanin content over the season, just showing in by comparison leaf, which remains fairly stable. But you do see like they accumulate anthocyanins differently. And really like to use these genetic resources, we have to understand like what are their unique qualities and characteristics. So this is a large portion of our research is, you know, looking at the genetic relationships, like characterizing so that, you know, tart cherry researchers or breeders could come in and make selections from our material for their unique projects. Now moving on to the grape collection. So this is, um, this is my baby. This is what I was hired to do as the, the grape curator. But uh, typically we think of, you know, Vitus vinifera, the cultivated grapevine, and sometimes we kind of forget the unique history that grapes have in New York State. And um, so this is from uh, E.P. Hedrick's Grapes of New York from 1912. Some of these uh, beautiful watercolors and really highlight the diversity of grape. Um, so I mentioned the grape collection is split into two parts in uh, the MPGS, the germplasm system. So California holds most of the, the grapes, which include the Vitus vinifera, your common uh, cultivated grapevine. We have mostly hybrids in our collection, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, uh, touch on that a little bit more, but really you can see the, the, the contrast between a beautiful Vitus vinifera and some of our grapes that we are working with. Really nothing you'd want to see in the store, but they have tremendous value. This was from a project that they, uh, our team worked on several years ago and looking at, you know, the kind of the, the phylogenies and genetic diversities of grapevine as a whole. And grapes are, are kind of unusual in terms of domestication because they, here is where Vitus vinifera originates from, but there are two centers of diversity that are not, usually those centers of diversity are also sites of domestication and not so the, in, in grapevine. So really uh, what's amazing is that we are a center of diversity for so much uh, grapevine, you know, interesting species. Uh, there's about 30 or anywhere from 30 to 60 species and hybrids and they get revised uh, quite frequently. <laughs> uh, but what's so powerful is that we can use these, you know, these interesting and wild species in, in breeding, especially for, for New York climate. So like this is, you know, such a, a very distinct climate from, from New York State, and where most of the grape production in the U.S. is in uh, California, but you know, the, so these wild grapevines can really expand where grapes are grown. So this is just kind of a, you know, a, a sliding window, if you want, of you know, this is wild species Vitus labresca. Here we have Vitus labresca, which is the the fox grape, which these are um, very interesting and difficult to work with because I think. Terry Bates would know that like you go to grab the berries and they just all shed. So it's like really different undomesticated traits and challenging <laughs> to work with or harvest. But you, you hybridize Vitus labresca with a Vitus vinifera and you get this very historic and very important con uh, hybrid, grape hybrid Concord, which is one of the most you know, successful North American grapes in, in the world. Or you can do another you know, hybridization and get Cuga white, another very important uh, grape hybrid that's uh, important wine grape and then contrasted with vitus vinifera so like you'll see cluster variation the, you know the berry size the berry color the flavors are all very unique and when you hybridize grapes you get the bad with the goods you get the interesting flavors with the off flavors or most import importantly for new york is you get this cold hardiness so you're like this is uh, from jason londo who's our cold hardy physiologist in in geneva but like this is something that vitus vinifera cannot handle so this is really limits what can be grown in, in New York State or other uh, cold hardy zones. But this is, you know, probably the primary reason and threat to our collection. And the reason why we don't graft is so that as vines die off, they will regrow from the roots and we can, you know, preserve the, the accessions. But with, uh, with grape breeding is you can't go too far beyond um, the, the cold hardy hybrids because if you keep trying to integrate get better vinifera traits you're going to lose that that most important trait with cold hardiness but you can also imagine you know disease resistance uh phylloxera another big pest all of those interesting traits come from wild uh grapevines 
one of the things that we've worked on over the last uh, several years is looking at phenology. So this is very important, the timing of when buds, uh, the vines come back, you know, leave dormancy, when they flower, when they go into veracin. So um, over five years, we scored our entire collection, about uh, 1,500 vines for these diverse traits. And you can really see like bud break, this first trait like really doesn't shift too much in comparison with bloom or veraison. But like this could make or break your season, right? If you, if you bloom too or, or break bud too early in New York State, you're susceptible to winter damage. Once you hit that chilling requirement, a nice 70 degree day in March could put your vines into, you know, leaving dormancy and then they're at risk for, for cold hardy damage. So really understanding the, you know, when they come out, when they bloom, when they go into veraison is, is important for breeding and for a conservation uh, perspective. So we want to understand these different stages so that, you know, breeders or researchers could make selections from our material. So really I, I highlight this. We can break them into categorical data using, a, you know, just, a, you know, and look at them with mosaic plots. So here's bud break in the different stages, early, medium, and late, and then contrasted with bloom. So you see this very narrow box. We had only five accessions that fit the criteria of late bud break, but also early bloom, which would be fantastic for a climate like Geneva, where you're not you're you're maintaining dormancy, but then you're also not losing that 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 growing season, that short window in New York. So really, it's a, the two goals are avoid spring frost and develop fruit before winter, which sounds ridiculous, but we have some ex accessions that will just start flowering right before the winter frost will set in. So that would not be ideal for, for New York. Well, this was one of those uh, five accessions, uh, GVET 1672, a pre-breeding material from a, a, a historic breeder, Elmer Swenson. So this has very high fruit quality, excellent characterization. They described it as pineapple in flavor, um, and they listed it as interesting for white wine. But here is one of those you know, rare classes where they, they break bud, late, they bloom early, and then they complete their, their life cycle before the, the winter frost. We also do a lot with molecular characterization um, in grapes. We have several platforms that they've experimented with, SSRs, uh, SNP chips, uh, GBS data. But we can use this to really uh, to understand the, the diversity and how to better use our collection. So this was a panel that we had developed for, uh, for a study that I'll, I'll highlight in a little bit, but we have you know, molecular markers on our grapevines. And this one cluster here is a clone, which in the database, it's got a different name. It's listed as, one's listed as a wine grape, one is listed as a table grape. So you would easily mistake it as like, you know, these are two distinct accessions, but genetically they are clones of each other. Everything that falls within these two bands are either a, a first degree relatives, either a sibling or a parent offspring relationship. It's really just by looking at the molecular markers, we can eliminate a lot of the genetic redundancy that you would want for like an association study or any kind of more in-depth characterization. Now, more recently, we're using RH AmpSeq developed from the VitusGen project, and this will really be able to, to pull out pedigree information. So now we can look at hybrids and you know, hopefully be able to piece together their unique history of when we have the Vitus vinifera data sets as well. So I'm interested in chemistry and looking at some of the more natural variation in our Vitus species. And we're starting at a, a grapevine evaluation, looking at uh, muscat and foxy aromas. And there's a lot of interesting things here. We, it's grape, or especially from a wine perspective, it's very challenging to say what would make a good wine from a grape, but it's very easy to say like, what are the bad off flavors? But really no one's broadly characterized our germplasm collection. So if we can at least provide a, a database for, for uh, individuals to use and like make, uh, you know, select for more advanced studies, that would be fantastic. I do highlight, it's not from uh, Cornell's program, but cotton candy. Everyone always asks about cotton candy and how they, how they inject it with sweetness. And, you know, everyone's convinced that they've done something to give it that distinctive flavor. But no, it's, it's just traditional breeding. It's just, it's the, Vitus labresca background that gives it that distinctive flavor and then breeding for high sweetness. And of course we have Welch's highlight these, uh, these accessions here. I keep losing the cursor. These are 
hybrids developed out of Gallo wineries from our Geneva material. So like to look at our material and you know, you, you wouldn't really see much potential, very small fruit, very disastrous clusters. But here like within a few uh, cycles, you can actually develop some pretty beautiful looking cultivars. And th this is really everyone's favorite. I don't, I'm, sometimes it's frustrating because <laughs> everyone when they visit, they just want to talk about apple, but it is a, a beautiful and exciting collection to work with. And again, it's not an all-star collection. Like we mix the, the great in with the bad and, and everything, but this is, you know, we say an apple a day. So with our collection, that's one apple a day for about 15 years. So students always ask like, have you tasted everything? And my answer is no, like I, I can't, possibly taste everything, especially if you wanted to, to sample it in its prime. And then they get pretty sympathetic after a week of eating fruit and they, they, they back off a little bit. But it's you know, a wonderful collection to walk through and taste. And apple itself has a, a very unique domestication history. It, apple is a, a hybrid. So originating out of, out of Malice, um, or out of Kazakhstan, Central Asia, Malice Seversiae you know, traded and then through uh, clonal propagation, like now you can preserve genotypes, not just trade seeds. So these material, you know, traveled along the silk route where it hybridized with Malus sylvestris. So Malus sylvestris is very bland, very flat in fruit quality, but it's a nice large size. Sometimes the sweetness is there, but then Malus sylvestris is where you get that acidity, which like combining acidity and sweetness is like what makes apple such a, an appealing fruit. And then, so this domestication, you know, is, is a fascinating process because it's like masked by evolutionary uh, events, masked by hybridization events, and it's very challenging, it's been challenging to unravel. And also apple is self-incompatible, highly heterozygous. So it, it's only, um, you know, it's outbreeding only creates more genetic diversity for us to use. So when you look at other crops, like relatively, like apple still has not really been fully domesticated it preserves a lot of the allelic diversity found in wild populations. And then modern apple breeding also brings in other wild species, makes other hybrids to get in uh, unique novel traits. And I wouldn't be a good uh, student of Susan Brown's if I didn't highlight Snapdragon. So like we've come a long ways in terms of, um, of apple, history of apple domestication. It's a, you know, again, a fantastic apple, but it's, it's you know, she's already looking to the future. Breeders are always, you know, looking towards that next cultivar, like what's going to be something that consumers will be excited about, something that will bring new life. I love uh, phenolics. This is where I studied in my PhD. And apples are interesting because not only they don't have the highest amount of, of phenolic content in the foods that we eat, but they contribute about 33% of the dietary phenolics. So if you're thinking cranberries are like amazing, like I don't eat cranberries every day, but apples are so accessible. And I studied a, a unique subgroup of phenolics called dihydrochalcones. And they are, a, you know, there's only 256 described across the plant kingdom. But in humans, like the main one in apple, fluoridzin, has a unique role in diabetes. And this molecular mechanism is pretty well worked out so that they even base a, a, a pharmaceutical drug on this, um, uh, this fluoridzin, this apple metabolite mechanism. Really, we don't understand its role in plants. So there's always like the idea that, oh, high phenolics is related to disease resistance, or it really doesn't, it's not conclusive. But they do find that it might have a role in auxin. So when you silence fluorids in production in apple, you get all sorts of strange morphology that, that ensues. So really understanding uh, the more the role in plants is, is a fascinating thing for me. So I, I say it's rare and abundant because it's, you know, you don't find fluorids in many other plants or in other foods that we eat, but it's so abundant in, in the leaves and the bark, especially of apple. And the fruit, it does drop a little bit to two to 6%. So there's other phenolics that are, are primary in there. There are um, derivatives that are very fascinating. So fluoridzin is the primary metabolite in apple, but then you get this trilobitin named after Malus trilobata. So then instead of producing fluoridzin, this species only produces trilobitin in high quantities. The same with Cyboldin. So other uh, species, Malus Turingo from Asia, um, Malus Zumi from uh, Southeast Asia, like these species only produce uh, Cyboldin instead of Fluoridzin. And then you look at the chromatography, so you get these nice uh, profiles that fall out and it, uh, we determine that it, it really does follow a, a single gene codominant expression in, in Apple. 
so we looked at you know leaf content variation for our collection so this represents you know the the, the diversity of apple species in our in our collection with malice domestica really falling towards the, the low, lower end of the spectrum so there's some really extreme examples and really understanding like what is the physiology of florids and content like why are apples producing it so we created some mapping populations uh, from Susan's program. It's a uh, New York 152 crossed by one of our wild accessions from our collection. And you see, so, wow, that's really jumpy. So uh, the hybrid cross was a uh, Floridsen type crossed by one with all three types. And you get this beautiful Mendelian segregation that, that, that falls out. And from there, we identified some uh, two major QTLs related to Cybolden and uh, Trilobatin content, but not for Floridsen. So really, we're getting at the, the root of uh, dihydrochalcone genetics in, um, in Apple. And from there, you can get into more of the, the physiology. And then, like again, looking at the genetic variation. So this red group represents the Malus domestica. Here's all the Severcii. So this makes sense that you know, these would group closely together. This is the primary progenitor of Apple. This is like a hybrid zone. And then these are all the, the Asian species with that unique chemical types. And here, this is separating it by uh, morphological characteristics. So you have all of the domesticated ones, primarily separates by fruit size and quality. And then here's like all the wild. So the unique chemistry all resides in these small fruited, you know, very bitter, very tannic, very acidic apples. And then we, we got into sports and these are, you know, a beautiful phenomenon in apples or in, in colonially propagated crops because we can capture diversity in, you know, from sport mutations. And so this is all, these are all genetically golden delicious. These are russeting mutations. And when you look at the Floridsen profile in the peel, you see that like this razor, this very russeted uh, mutation has almost uh, four times the amount of Floridsen in the peel as in the, the standard golden delicious. And this is a beautiful extreme example of a chimera. So this a mutation arose early in these cells and this section is all russeted. So we could sample russet versus waxy and found that like, yeah, fluorids and content definitely accumulates more in the, in the waxy or in the russeted portion than in the waxy. Um, russeting is very common in potatoes and uh, pears, but we don't really see it much in, in apples. But this is a very important historic trait caused by the degradation of the cuticle in, in apples. So here's a nice healthy cuticle. And sometime during early development, we see the degradation. And what happens at this stage is the, the fruit, you know, waterproof and um, lays down a layer of suberin. So we're replacing cuticle waxes with suberin there. It's actually pretty rare of a trait in, in our collection. So here's zero to 5% russeting and full russets are actually, you know, not very common. When we look at the, the, the Floridsen and russeting by group, we see that Floridsen definitely increases by, um, I lost the cursor there. So it, it definitely increases by group, but also within group, you see a lot of you know, extreme examples in, in Floridsen content. And sorry for any Honeycrisp fans, like Honeycrisp has very low Floridsen content compared to, these are some of the higher ones with you know, upwards of 753 in Arkansas black. That's a, sorry, uh, micrograms per gram of tissue. And really the genetic component explains, you know, quite a bit of this. Is that uh, skin tissue or flesh? That's skin, yes. So when we looked at the flesh, we did skin, flesh, and uh, leaf tissue. There's no difference in the, in the leaves, you know, for, uh, related to russeting or in the, in the flesh as well. So it is uh, localized in the russet peel. So uh, one thing that we can do, you know, so we can separate the russeting the explained percentage of, of fluorids and content variation in russeting by looking at more sports. So these were a group of uh, five sport families that like they varied. So the, the, the point diameter size represents the percentage of fluorids in, or the uh, percentage of russeting and then the, the X axis, the, the fluorids and content. So you see in Golden Delicious, you have this increasing russeting, increased fluorids in. The same with the other accessions. And now we're explaining about 62% of uh, fluorids and variation with russeting. So it's a, a really interesting way to, to increase, uh, to understand uh, fluorids and accumulation and development in, in apples. 
using this model. And again, following fruit development, russeting begins early on in this stage. This is maybe two, uh, two to three weeks after uh, petal fall in apple, but already russeting is set in here. And you can see it, it only uh, accumulates russeting there. But the amount of fluorids in that, uh, that is maintained in these russeted fruits stays much higher in, than in, in their waxy type counterparts. Again, we don't see that trend for, for leaves or for, for flesh. And really, the, I, my hypothesis is that this pathway of fluoridzin and flavonoids is linked into suberin and lignin pathways as well. And so we have some, some studies, hopefully, that we can um, complete looking at the, the gene expression of resting uh, in the resting pathway and also make some more explorations into the fluoridzin pathway as well. And wouldn't you know it, so this is the population I studied. It's grown up now, this is Susan's new student, but it's segregating for chemistry and resting. So this is like a really exciting population to use for, for further studies in dihydrochalcones in apples. I have to highlight the, the exciting cider work and evaluations that's happening. So cider is a very popular uh, growing trend in, in apples, heirlooms, and, and other things. But they're evaluating a lot of the fruit chemistry, fruit quality associated in our collection. And again, this enriches our collection because now we know more about our accessions that can be available to the, to the public. Uh, Thomas Chow, who was the, the predecessor, who, who uh, the apple curator, went on this fantastic uh, exploration to Vietnam to look for wild apple, and I just highlight that here. So before this exploration, only a single accession of this, this tropical timber apple, Malus uh, dumeri. Here's the fruit here. So they went into the jungles of Vietnam to collect material seeds and, and brought those back. So those will be housed in, in Geneva and in Corvallis, Oregon, because they are very cold sensitive. Really just to highlight you know, the, the group that we work with, the fantastic USDA team, but also several people that, that we collaborate with at, at Cornell University. And, and thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yes, Anna. So as you keep replanting this about grapes and apples, do you find any epigenetic variations? Um, th that can come up, yes, yeah. Not so much. So tissue culture will give you a lot more of the epigenetic, the somoclonal variation. We do try to capture, when we find interesting mutants, we do try to capture and propagate those. They're, they don't always take. So really those mutations are still tremendously valuable, but still rare. But are you worried that you might lose what that original is kind of what it looks like? Uh, so, I mean, it was still, the, the genetic... It, the composition is there, the allelic variation is there, even if the, the trait has slightly shifted. So do we need like, what, like dozens of sports of Red Delicious to conserve Red Delicious? So you may not know, like Red Delicious, the original was not as red as it is today, and they've selected redder and redder sport mutations. It's like whether we keep one at the end or the, the actual tree alive. So that's, yeah, that's, it's a concern, but primary, it's more keeping up with disease is our primary Okay, my question again, how do you deal with phylloxera or anything? So phylloxera, are we, we just deal with. We just tolerate because our vines are, uh, have resistance. So we get foliar phylloxera, which is unappealing to, to look at, but it really doesn't impact the vine bigger. Whereas vinifera, yes, it, it is a major concern. A great story of like a gift from North America to Europe was our gift of powdery mildew and phylloxera. But... <laughs> We swooped in with our germplasm and saved the day. So now they primarily use rootstocks developed from North American species that have that phylloxera resistance. Tim. Yeah, Ben, can you comment? Uh, I know in, uh, in grapes there's several private breeders that might get material from you. So uh, what do they get? Um, and what do you tell them about the uh, phytosanitary status of these things? Yeah, so the, the phytosanitary is challenging because we can't promise that the material is disease-free. We do say it's pest-free. We So mostly viruses is the biggest yeah, concern you know, it's for grapes. Viruses. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's generous. <laughs> it's, yeah, we have some virus problems, but really there's the only way to remediate that is to do, you know, to do cryotherapy or thermotherapy to get clean lines, which we cannot feasibly do. So. Yeah, we, we put out the, the notice that we 
you can't expect everything to be disease free, although we do have inspectors come and look for, for pests. So we do our diligence to not you know, spread disease, especially uh, international. You know, we don't really export anything grape internationally. So they do have some pretty strict requirements in the EU and, and elsewhere. Do you send out pollen people? We do, yes. Yeah, so a lot of you know, grape industry will get pollen from us that they can use for crosses or seeds or easily exchange, although those do carry viruses as well. Well, it's a challenge because we, we don't want to, there's no point in keeping the material if we're not distributing it. So if we can't get it to the people who need it, then who are we, what are we serving here? Other than it's nice to have a historic collection to walk through. But so it's that keeping up with distribution. Yes. Then are there still places in the world that sort of are yet unexplored or the drip plants are still there that we'd love to go to and bring it out? So there, there has been some more work, like for example, I'm just thinking of like Italy right now. So I have two malice accessions or seed accessions that are unique species to Italy and that like have never really been explored. So I've like, I'm germinating a subset of those for now, but yeah, there, there's material all over the world. Thomas Chow really was exploring native North American malice species, looking at, you know, so he was hoping to eventually, I think, exchange more into Canada, but exploring the, the Southern region, the Eastern regions, a lot has been done on the, the Pacific crab from California down to Oregon and BC and, and all of that. But yeah, there's still, there's still places, not just for our crops, but all over the world. So MPGS sponsors, you know, uh, plant exchanges or exploration visits to these sites. I think there's another trip to Vietnam in the works. So they didn't get enough there. They want to go to different sites and bring more back. So it's a continual process of exploring for plants, bringing them into the collections. <laughs> Shantanu, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Once you get something from uh, Vietnam, like so, do you screen them before you plant them or something, or does that take how how how, how long? Yeah. So we brought seeds back from Vietnam as well as some cyan. So the cyan's go directly to Beltsville, I believe. I might be over, you know, thinking that one. But like, so if we go out and find unique trees in the forests of like Kazakhstan, where the original curator Phil Forza went, he brought those back. Some of those are still in quarantine, trying to be cleaned. So there's, I think, one accession since the 90s that they just can't get virus clean to clear, to, to release to us. So yeah, so with seeds, they, they can go through a quick evaluation and go directly to the site. So we already have access to the, the Dumeri seeds. Now it's just, if there are any interesting clonal vari you know, types that were from Vietnam that they want here. So, the, I mean, so we have a, a vast collection of mouse, Severciae from Kazakhstan and Asia. All, most of that came through a seed. It's a lot of late nights at the hotel, collecting fruit, and then pulling out seeds. Very exciting. Yes? Uh, we, we know that there are many North American native apples. What's the thought of how they came here? I mean, presumably it was sort of Middle Eastern where they started, and then they... Yeah. Is there any understanding of how they got to North America? That's a, a, that's a great question and I'll you know add my own philosophy is that like with our horticultural crops a lot of those questions get ignored so we want to really understand domesticated crops but then we forget like oh there's this strange group in North America like when you do the genetic studies they are most basically related to the other Asian apple species so presumably they might be more ancient is the thought than some of the the, of the Central Asian apples which is really interesting because how do they get here so we have three species on the east coast and then the southern regions and then one species on the Pacific side. That one is more closely related to the Asian apple. So there is that idea that came through on the land bridge, but like how these North American apples, how they fit into the evolutionary history. But a lot of those, again, it's unfortunate that some of those studies get ignored or kind of overlooked because they, the priority is to, you know, to serve the industry and, and to... Genetically, there's always mapping, presumably there could be some elucidation of yeah. where they came from. Yeah, a lot of them are, are beautiful from an ornamental perspective, like the prairie crab, Malus iowensis, like a lot of like multi-petals, a lot of beautiful colors. The fruit is not anything too exciting, but maybe from a cider perspective, there's some unique chemistry there. Yeah, from, yeah, from a botanical, like we all care about the botany, not just the, the horticulture. But really, it is unfortunate that we get kind of pigeonholed towards the domesticated crops. 
So on, on that um, slide about the rust, the rusted sport population, yes. I think it was five or six um, different cultivars that are in the PGRU. Were all those sport, uh, all those rusted sports also represented in Geneva, or were you collecting that? So this was, yeah, this was 100% Geneva. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's definitely other rusted sport families or other interesting sport families that we could, I think, from a, a conservation perspective, they're not very useful because you're not, you're, you're kind of, it's a lot of uh, allelic redundancy, but then you have that one unique characteristic that you want to propagate. But from a research perspective, like keeping clones, even if they take up space, like it's very useful to like conduct research on anthocyanin con content or accumulation, or this was perfect for our study in russeting. So it, you kind of have to like go back and forth on like, do we need more? sport families or like do we pull back and only preserve the high diversity material because yeah, i noticed all the those names were ones that have been collected by the tech lab but i didn't realize that there were all these russet sports of them also in the yeah yeah so one more question if there is one uh, i guess yeah else. so following following up on this question so are you saying that there might be another, uh, so generally what we understand is that the apples move from Kazakhstan to the crowd this way and also there's that land. So is there, is through the work that's being done, do you think there's another way that the apples came here or maybe they originated here? Or? So this uh, is showing the, I'm sorry, if you do need to leave, I, yeah, no worries. So really, it's this is showing like the domestication history of, of the modern, the Western apple, right? So like there was actually another route that apples took um, the other side of the mountain into China. So like their Cerversii, their like their cultivated apple is unique genetically from the Western apples that have been developed. But in terms of like, so along this route, they passed like maybe six, seven other apple species, and so like they didn't really contribute to domestication. So like how they got there, like going past and through Italy, there's Malus Sylvestris, but there's also Malus Florentina. There's also Malus Baccata, which is like understanding how that one contributed as well. So really, it's, again, like we don't know much about the evolutionary history of, of Apple. So a lot of work was done in the 90s with Emily Dixon, a Cornell PhD. So she did a lot of explorations, which Thomas tried to follow up with and seeing are these sites still there are these native populations and now we have the material can we do genetic studies and see more their unique history all right i want to thank ben gutierrez for great talk. this has been a production of cornell university on the web at cornell.edu